Hello everyone, thanks for coming. It looks like a week and a bit of uh, Stuart Marks talk here, uh, and you know, probably all that imposters who build insecure APIs, at least that's what comes from the talks rating today. Um, my name is Mitri Chuiko, and we are going to talk about some Java on some ARMs. Well, it seems to be treated as a new topic or uh, something unusual, but ARMs are very common now. So we all have ARM devices in our pockets, and running Java is, is a done, is a trivial thing to me. But still, it, it takes some interest. So I participate in OpenJDK development as an OpenJDK committer, and uh, I work at a company named Bellsoft, who is among top OpenJDK contributing, uh, top companies contributing to OpenJDK. And we release our own distribution, which is, by the way, the default distribution uh, used uh, in Spring Boot containers. This is uh, an OpenJDK distribution called Liberica JDK. Uh, and um, besides of that, we have our own Linux distro, perfectly suitable for containers or pine compatible Alpaquita, and uh, a build of GraalVM Community Edition, a project where we also participate, and it's called Liberica Native Image Kit. You can come to our booth and figure out more about them. So that are our contributions, different colored rectangles here, and there's a green one, and you can find us. And we can switch to other colored rectangles, the ones that we look at every day. Uh, but these are not actually for Java, and we will talk about slightly different devices, probably older or newer than the ones pictured here. That's just a stock picture, and you see all that fat uh, bezels. We don't need them anymore. Well, what's about ARM? ARM is an, a processor architecture and a company, and now it's a public company. By the way, there are strategic investors like Intel, who has its own pretty famous computer architecture, right? And it participates in funding or buying or managing ARM, uh, ARM holdings as a public company. And there are many, many, many ARM devices. So that was a great uh, journey from the very beginning of the architecture of an idea of having some very uh, sim simple uh, instruction set and approach uh, for building computers to more than 250 billion devices that are already shipped by this year. So that's a lot. And it's going to be many more of them. And what happens, uh, what does it mean for us, for Java developers? Well, first of all, ARM is an ISA, is a set of instructions. Well, in fact, there are multiple sets of instructions. And we'll just look at some of them. And for that sets of instructions, uh, for that architecture, there's a profile for, for that architecture. And for us, the main, as Java developers and people who run Java on such devices, the main uh, profile is called A, application profile, which is a set of capabilities that are perfectly suitable to run a JVM. And there are multiple versions of the spec, and they have uh, that profile in them. And there are execution modes, and the most modern and right mode for us is AR64 execution mode, uh, which gave its name to a port in OpenJDK, and it operates with A64 instruction set. So we can talk about instruction set, or we can search for a specific instruction, what does it mean, how it should be encoded, and we refer A64 manual for that. Yeah, and by the way, it's not as boring as trying to understand what Intel instructions mean, right? It's, it's much easier, typically. 
Well, and that uh, instruction set is licensed, licensed to different companies that build real hardware, actual hardware. While ARM stated that probably we are going to see some reference hardware by ARM, but like in publicly, but we haven't seen one. So, and there are multiple types of licenses. Uh, for some simple uh, variants, you can even get a free license and build your own device, but that won't probably be able to run Java. So for us, it's more interesting what happens with slightly more powerful ones. And there's a plethora of them. Uh, there are reference designs, uh, there are Cortex cores that different uh, manufacturers adopt and use in, in their hardware. And before uh, RMV9 appeared, and I'll mention that later, uh, we had two major branches. Like we had ARMv7, a 32-bit architecture or an instruction set, uh, and uh, ARMv8, 64-bit uh, ARM. And they can be supported in, a, in the same device. So a same device, same CPU can operate in different modes. It, like it happens uh, with well-known uh, CPUs used in Raspberry Pis, for example. And they can be switched or booted into 32-bit mode or into a 64-bit mode, right? It is still true. And this a feature that used to be kind of unique for ARM, and still uh, it's, it's used very widely. You can combine different types of CPU, or different types of cores in a single CPU, and you can uh, put a certain load and certain cores, you can schedule them uh, on, on the operating system uh, layer, and to switch them off and on, right? You can combine power efficient cores and high performance cores, uh, and nowadays, even the typical design is to have three types of cores. Like you have, you can have medium cores, low power cores, and super power cores, right? Intel does that as well. So now you can get some desktop uh, designs where uh, you see high power cores and low power cores, right? Uh, specifically, uh, the ones mentioned here can be found in a, in a single uh, in a single chip, and and that even uh, that A710 is very interesting because uh, it's it's being used in mobile devices, but uh, the uh, characteristics or design um, in very recent uh, Neverse N2 is kind of close or similar to uh, uh, that core. So we know different applications, especially in embedded uh, space. And by the way, just, I don't know, last week, uh, Raspberry Pi 5 was finally released, right? Anyone had one? No, me, oh, single person. Congratulations, that's, it's just like iPhone Pro. <laughs> You should, you should wait for it. <coughs> so yes, it was a long time between Pi 4 and Pi 5, and Pi 5 is rather powerful. I'll mention it um, together with some server designs, and we'll see uh, how they're close. So still, we have that 32-bit mode, and Java operates in that 32-bit mode still. We are still probably the major company that still supports that port. I'm not sure how long it will be you know, still functional and will stay in uh, most recent JDKs, but it's still there. You can still uh, download, install, and use uh, very recent features with uh, ARM32. And for such devices that are typically low capable, uh, it's possible to create minimalistic runtime that will consume less resources. Well, it will have a uh, smaller static footprint. Uh, it won't have any unnecessary features. Like if you only uh, need some s simple garbage collection, you probably don't need it all. And if you need uh, a better startup uh, and more power efficient uh, JIT compilation, you can stick to a client VM 
that won't have a C2 compiler. And at the same time, you would be able to use hardware acceleration for your graphics for uh, JavaFX. So for devices like Raspberry Pi 2, which is rather old now, you can get uh, up-to-date Java, you can get JavaFX right in there, and it will uh, use uh, your hardware resources, it will utilize your hardware resources properly, so you would get uh, smooth graphics, animations, and other uh, stuff. Uh, and that's amazing. Uh, I already mentioned uh, that client VM, and you can also get minimal VM if you're really tight on disk space, but that will probably uh, impact your performance very much, though it's still better than some open JDK builds for different uh, you know custom uh, operating systems and routers um, that that just contain o interpreter only. So having uh, JIT is much, much better. So let's get back to the architecture. It evolved for many years. There are releases of the architecture, and the major timeline here is for uh, V8. B below the line, you see some dates, and uh, that are years, and um, sometimes months, then the spec has been released. And devices on top appeared only a few years after the, re the release of this certain version of a specification, because it takes some time to actually uh, implement uh, your specification in silicon, to test it, to debug it, to produce devices, to debug, produce devices, <laughs> and to ship, it, to ship devices to customers. So there are famous uh, devices, and we started to work with uh, Thunder X uh, processors. Uh, so you see uh, the version of spec is 2011, and we met uh, the devices in about 2017. That's a huge gap. And still, there's the same uh, two, four years gap between the spec release and actual devices. At the same time, uh, you can see A53, uh, which is still widely used. You can get a TV or a low-end some ARM uh, box uh, with A53 cores, or uh, you still can get Raspberry Pi 3, which is extremely popular and probably one of our favorite devices, and we still test on them. Uh, it's powered by A53. And the newest one is powered by A76. So, uh, you see, it, it was uh, released and it supports the same version of spec as many popular server designs. Like now, version 1, I will mention it today. Uh, we'll see some examples of server machines uh, that follow or uh, use that design. Or uh, A64FX, which is also a powerful one. So the same version of spec. <coughs> and you see uh, that every uh, box here contains some additions. And those additions are actually extensions. So it's an extensible development of the specification where new extensions are added. Uh, some, of them, uh, some of them must present in a certain version of spec. And some of them are optional and they can become uh, necessary in future versions. And you see some just some examples in, in, in that boxes. Like s is from the very beginning, RMV8 had CMD extension, but it's a kind of a limited thing, uh, which is now being replaced uh, with a newer vector extension called SV and SV2, uh, and that's, uh, that means scalable vector extension. Uh, and we have... Uh, different options, how to accelerate cryptography, checksums, uh, by different specialized uh, extensions for like CRC2, CRC32 or AS, uh, just like uh, some extensions in uh, Intel processors. 
you can de detect that you have a certain extension in your CPU and you can apply or generate optimized code. That's what OpenJDK does. Then you invoke JIT compiler or then you use some intrinsics. You can get that optimizations dynamically. So it's been determined in runtime. Uh, what, what's the processor you run on and uh, it, it can be done. Uh, some new extensions uh, cover more and more uh, features uh, like cryptography and machine learning, like support for operations with new data types uh, on, on CPU uh, that allows you to effectively uh, learn, or train, or and apply uh, your neural networks uh, on on CPUs, not just on GPUs. Um, Again, see later versions. Uh, some some typical demand is like uh, having wider atomics, uh, and other features sometimes used uh, in in clouds or in specialized deployments where you need uh, better virtualization support uh, to execute all all your virtualization transparently and very effectively. Uh, well, in the right part of this timeline, there are notable, very modern CPUs like M2, which is an Apple Silicon die, and Ampere 1, which is, again, a very uh, modern one. While uh, we'll compare uh, some characteristics uh, with uh, older ones, like, for example, the number of cores. Like the champion here is Thunder X3, that hasn't been publicly released and uh, used in I don't know, public clouds, but it had like 384 cores. That's, that's really a huge number. Well, and finally, we have ARM v9, and we already have devices that implement uh, that version of the spec. This is uh, a continuation of ARM v8, actually, but ARM decided that, well, it's time to call it ARM v9 because uh, all the changes uh, that were collected through the years form a really a, a new major version for this spec. So the devices here uh, include uh, ARM design uh, Nervous N2, and there are already implementations, uh, hardware uh, that uh, does uh, that uses uh, this design. And there are mobile chips, uh, Neocortex ones, and in particular this uh, version includes support for hardware transactional memory, so uh, a topic that used to be popular uh, for quite some time. And Intel also had implementation that was disabled and probably enabled back in some, uh, in some of its CPUs. So I mentioned licensing uh, and all the different uh, companies that produce real hardware. They are licensees and sometimes investors uh, in ARM holdings. And ARM develops designs. So you can license, as a company, you can license the architecture and create your own implementation, basically from scratch. Or you can buy some IP blocks, which is, again, a typical situation. Or you can acquire the entire design and adapt it to your needs. Well, there are multiple versions for newer ARM designs, and they have split it to them uh, to areas where they are applied, like um, high-performance computing, like server computing, and some you know, embedded or uh, edge applications. And they all evolved through for years, and we are now to the right of this picture, because it's 2023, uh, but still that uh, generation is, is actual right now. So let's get back to 2019. So that's the Thunder X2, a powerful two, uh, two socket machine, and that had a lot of cores. Especially at that time, that that really uh, looked crazy, and the machines that our machines, server machines that we have now, 
I also follow that idea. To bring you effectiveness, you get a single server that has a lot of cores, uh, that doesn't require a lot of power, uh, no, no big hit. Uh, and that's uh, Ampere One, by the way. So the newest one, it's, it has like DDR5 memory, uh, some cool interconnects, uh, all the fancy things, and it looks cool, right? So it's, it's, uh, it has just been released this year. On top of that hardware, some software runs. That includes OpenJDK, of course. That includes operating systems. It wasn't so obvious for many years, but since, I don't know, 2019, 18, uh, it's not a problem anymore. So you can get your favorite operating system, most likely, and you can install it and run without the problems on an ARM class machine and you'll get all your software ecosystem right there. You'll have all your load balancers, all your different managed runtimes, including OpenJDK, your databases. You can run them all. Well, what this talk is about, we'll see some interesting moments. Well, even if you can run it, probably it would be better to have optimizations, right? It, it's the best to have uh, all the performance from your actual hardware for your software. And your software in particular, OpenJDK, has to be aware of all the capabilities, has to utilize them. That was the focus of the project that uh, we were into uh, for a few years, bringing more optimizations to different intrinsic to native to native parts of OpenJDK. So most of it uh, has been uh, done for uh, Java 11. I have a separate talk on that. Uh, or later ones were successfully backported, like most of uh, optimizations for this backend were backported to JDK 11 updates. So if you compare like stock JDK or GA JDK 11 and recent updates so that you still can get, you get better performance. Of course, during our work that that performance optimization, optimizations, we measure performance somehow. And it's also possible that required kind of tuning or fixing some tools, but it's really not a problem. Uh, you can hear talks about uh, performance analysis like the one that was on Tuesday or on Monday. All, all the tools and approaches you saw there, you can uh, use them for your ARM machines, uh, either local or remote. And for uh, feature development for uh, your real code, just beware of uh, specifics of the architecture. Like some implementations are uh, not so, um, uh, they won't forgive you if you make mistakes in your Java code. And here I mean uh, your Java code that runs in parallel, so you have concurrent execution, and you're not strict enough with your data, with synchronization that you must have there. You will get some wrong results. And it won't happen every time. So this code on x86, uh, don't uh, won't, won't show you any kind of wrong executions that that will break uh, the logic of your program. But on ARM, it will. Even on older ARM processors, like listed here, uh, there are some moments when uh, different memory accesses are reordered inside the CPU, and that's according to the spec, and that's according to the Java memory model. But you won't, you won't see it on x86. And the same happens on new ARM hardware. So just be aware of it. So let's get back to the roadmap. And you see, uh, just like with Cortex cores, uh, the um, Neoverse, the roadmap for high power server cores provides very different points or covers different areas. Uh, 
uh, for chips. And there are usages of the designs in, in some products available on, for you uh, in the cloud, or you can physically buy them. And different clouds can provide, uh, if, if they use uh, uh, designs by ARM, they still provide different versions of it. So let's look at some products here, like the big iron that has been released. Uh, NVIDIA Gray is pictured here. So that's a combination of uh, 144 ARM cores and some NVIDIA GPUs. That's a very powerful beast. Well, uh, it's not for traditional cloud computing, right? Because we all write CRUD applications. Though, on this conference, we constantly hear about different machine learning and AI and Java. And the same happens in other conferences, and that's an interesting moment. So, mm, for some applications, it will make sense to take such hardware. There's a supercomputer hardware, uh, like A64FX custom chip by Fujitsu, and this was the first chip that implemented uh, that vector extensions in silicon. And ARM vector extensions are very interesting because they are you don't have a fixed size, like with AVX, you know that AVX 512, right? It, it mentions its size. And with SV, you can determine what's the size, so your hardware can provide some size. It can tell you what the size is, and you write your algorithm in assembly and in machine code, uh, and that algorithm can be independent of the vector size. You can implement that. And that NVIDIA Grace uh, follows V2 uh, ARM design. Uh, another supercomputer example here is uh, uh, Ducalion, uh, recently launched in Portugal, just this, this fall. Uh, and uh, one more example uh, from now um, the cloud space or your regular server-side uh, applications uh, is Alibaba Yutan, which is uh, ARM N2. And uh, it has been compared, uh, like this physical uh, implementation has been compared uh, to some previous generation, to some N1 implementation. Uh, and if you compare them side by side, uh, like in microarchitectural improvements in what you can see in silicon besides of the topological uh, resolution of the die. Uh, there are numerical improvements up to 2x. So you get uh, very, uh, very good improvements from generation to generation, and each generation appears every two, three years. Well, what about smaller machines? In 2019, we experimented with this one. So that's Jetson Nano, first gen, uh, funny little box, and I remember we came to Java 1 and we shown a demo where we combined real-time uh, uh, image recognition from video from the video stream, like uh, their application uh, determined uh, people in your video stream, an actual camera uh, in, in the hall, and said how many people it sees, and we counted and provided some statistics in JavaFX on this running on the same small box. And it took like 10 watts to run. And well, I decided to explore the exhibition. And I saw a commercial solution for warehouses from some famous company. And they provided two blade servers doing basically the same thing. And that was kind of a strong proposition. I said, well, why do you use that two blades? Well, that, that's just an enterprise sol solution. Uh, well, at that time, we had to use chain eye or other tricks uh, to pass data back and forth between the native part, right, that worked with the GPU and some APIs provided by uh, uh, the development kit, and Java. Now, we have foreign function interface and foreign memory access in OpenJDK. 
and that's a bright future. Uh, you can check some talks from recent JVMLS about uh, code reflection and new transformations for your code, uh, about FFI, and uh, please check that new project Babylon. That's a way to write uh, a code that uh, will turn into some code being executed on GPUs behind the scenes. And the, the code developers write is the code in Java language, which would be transparently turned into something running on GPUs. And that's very convenient. You don't have to care about all the data uh, transfers or what particular devices you have. It can be done automatically, and that's a uh, move to have it in OpenJDK. So let's get back to uh, the hardware uh, for our server-side applications. Well, this is an old picture, and there's a reference scene uh, or showing how uh, generations evolve. So the first gen was, was good, but the very recent ones are very powerful. So this is uh, uh, a chip from a company called Ampere, and uh, you can find it in Oracle Cloud, for example, because Oracle participates in that project, or at least some uh, persons. So it's easily available. Or you can buy one. You can buy one from the first generation, or probably you already can buy the most recent one uh, as, a, as a computer that you can put into your own data center or on your desk. Or there's another one. Already uh, there are three generations of AWS Graviton processors. And even first generation is no longer available uh, in EC2, but uh, two recent generations are available. And you can look at the evolution. Especially there's a speculative last line, just uh, some speculative estimation how how the performance evolved, how faster is the new generation compared to the old one. That's it. total speculation. But we'll look at some benchmarks. We see some different characteristics. They grow, and that's a noticeable grow in every line. Uh, well, probably besides all the frequency, right? Because we have some thermal limitations. And that means uh, the amount of cache frequency is probably limited, at least for all the designs of today. So if we run benchmarks and we take uh, Graviton 3 uh, versus, and we compare Graviton 3 versus Graviton 2 using Java 20, which isn't the most recent one, but was the most recent one available uh, at the time of the benchmarking. Or we can even take the next step. We can compare all processor and all Java, like Java 8, and we still have the port available and it's still supported. We have security updates for it, for that port. And newer Java on with a newer JDK. And you see, we can get like 23% improvements just by upgrading our stuff. And we probably don't really pay more or we, we just use this stuff that's available. If it would be compared with uh, the first gen, the difference would be just huge. You saw some speculative numbers, but uh, these numbers, uh, these are Java benchmarks. And they fully correspond to that speculative estimation. So it's about 20% improvement uh, just by using newer things. Uh, well, what about other implementations? So uh, as you understand, Gravitons are available in uh, EC2, in AWS Cloud. Uh, Ampere is available in Oracle Cloud. What about Google Cloud? Well, there's a rumor that probably we will see some Google designs, maybe even some custom uh, designs, not just um, 
uh, rework uh, by but from um, what ARM provides you. And other vendors, kind of traditional vendors, Intel and AMD, they now propose uh, new uh, uh, newer chips that has that have a lot of cores, like up to 288 cores, and these are chips. Uh, probably they are all they are, they are already available, um, and you see uh, both companies provide um, the uh, product lines where you can find either high power cores, more performant cores. Or low power cores, so less capable, but rec they require uh, less uh, power, and that really looks like what different uh, ARM chip makers provided. But we have a lot of cores; we don't consume a lot of power. Uh, there's some competition in um, core to core. Uh, performance, right? But what happens if they uh, compare costs directly? So that's a great uh, article or study uh, called X86 Massacre uh, in a time where uh, Graviton 2 has been released. Uh, they compared uh, costs for different workloads. So it's a fixed work workload and you can just calculate how much you have spent to execute that, that, that workflow. Well, and you see there's a great difference. And that was some time ago, but uh, when um, NVIDIA Grace has been released, it also has been compared to some more recent uh, Intel and AMD chips. And results are about the same. So yes, sometimes you get better time, right? For a certain fixed workload, you can you can have better core performance well and you can calculate certain things faster but if you compare costs in many cases the picture looks like this that is why cloud providers constantly grow the share of our machines in their fleets and they say okay we are going to have larger share of ARM machines in our fleets. And they participate, they release their own hardware because it gives probably more or better control of how it works. So the projection or some plans are to have more than 20% uh, as a share of our machines in some public clouds by 2025. It's like less than two years. Well, and we know that in public clouds, Java is very popular. But that's all about servers, right? But what about developer machines? Well, in some point in time, this happened. Oh, no. This has a fan. And this one doesn't have a fan. That's a very powerful machine without a fan. So you, it's totally silent, except clicking the buttons on, on the keyboard. That's so astonishing. Well, that's not the only device that you can use as a developer to touch development on ARM. There are multiple options. Like I would especially say there's a Lenovo machine that's just like this one. But it's more powerful because it's newer and it uses the very recent uh, chipset, uh, ARM-based one. Uh, the same uh, chipset is used uh, for the third one and the first one is what we actually uh, use for testing OpenJDK. It's a computer and it runs Windows, Windows and ARM and we can run some tests there, we can check graphics. That's cool. Well, but what do we run there? ARM ports of OpenJDK, right? And there are multiple ports 
Because for every operating system running on ARM, you have to have a version of that operating system running on ARM. And you have to have special scaffolding in OpenJDK source code, in tests, and all that things, and features to work properly on ARM. And now we have, uh, historically, it all started from Linux, of course, and it's still the major port. But now we have Windows support. We have macOS support. And it's not only for like the most recent versions of Java. You can get Java 11 for that uh, architectures. And for older ones, for 8 and 9, you can get uh, uh, Linux ports. And graphic wor graphics works there, right? And even you can create native images because in GraalVM, ARM architecture is also uh, supported as one of primary targets. Well, on some machines, we can run x86 port of Java. Like this is uh, M1, this is Apple Silicon, and we can compare emulated mode with Rosetta 2, where we run x86 version of Java, and we run the same benchmarks in a native mode. So we just compared it, some, compared it sometime. And the, the difference is like 2x. That's why you need uh, the native port. Besides the fact that emulation will be deprecated in, well, sometimes, sometime, uh, it's better to have uh, the best performance. All that specifics uh, are really uh, hidden in, inside the OpenJDK. Like if you create a garbage collector, you have a very uh, hardware specific parts of the implementation, like barriers for the garbage collector or different parts of it. And we now have all all that great garbage collectors available on ARM architecture, on ARM servers, including ZGC that has been only backported in JDK 13. So if you take JDK 17, yeah, you have them all. Uh, some certain uh, hardware features, like better atomic support, different instructions, uh, when they were utilized by OpenJDK, and as I mentioned, it, it it's determined dynamically when JDK starts. And uh, appropriate versions are used along the JDK, uh, the JVM lifetime. And it gave like 5% uh, boost to all the workloads. Or I mentioned vector uh, extensions. And we have something called vector in JDK, not vector class, I mean, but vector API which is designed to use that extensions, but that required some work and it, it's an ongoing work to support and to properly map all the operations from the API to their actual implementation. One more example is Loom, of course. Right now we have it finally released, but it has been developed as a preview feature for some time and, and it's platform specific. So you have to uh, implement it correctly for the platform. Another thing that I already mentioned is support for native code for a function memory interface, <coughs> which is still in preview in Java 21, but it works for ARM from, from the first preview. Well, let's finally <coughs> sorry, assemble all that and run in some production. Let's assemble a container. That's easy, right? And you saw the picture, that means that there's a friendship between ARM and Docker. We can assemble a container in many ways, but my favorite way is to use build packs. Unfortunately, that's the way that still doesn't work for ARM. There's an open issue, but I hope that at some time it will be finally fixed and we will have build packs uh, for different kinds of applications, Spring Boot, Quarkos, whatever, uh, running on ARM out of the box. Um, well, another thing is muscle support. What about Alpine Linux and Alpakita Linux? How about them? 
Well, when we uh, added support for Muscle in OpenJDK, uh, ARM was one of the targets. And now you can get the smallest containers, smallest container images with native ARM JDK and Muscle. And it's not a problem. You just uh, create your universal images or you create all the ARM images using uh, that base ones. Yes, and you can easily try that even on, on uh, your Apple Silicon machines. Uh, well, you can run an emulated ones there or you can run native ones there. Again, that's, that's an interesting experience uh, uh, which one uh, is more suitable for you. But using uh, your emulated ones uh, with x86 uh, sometimes allows you to uh, cross-develop uh, on ARM 4 x86 because you uh, may develop on an ARM machine or you may develop on an x86 machine, right? And your targets may be uh, different as well. So, you know, that's sometimes necessary to perform a cross development to perform some fixes. So, yes, you can create your Docker file. You don't mention any specific platform tags here, right? You just select an image that has uh, different platforms. And you invoke BuildX, a new Docker extension that gives you a container image for a different architecture or for a specific architecture. It may be the same as your uh, host one. So finally, we get it all working. Please remember to write your programs correctly. Test them. Test them on your target ISA. So if you're going to run on a certain CPU, run your tests on that CPU. That's obvious. But sometimes it's not true. Just, OK, it works in our development or in CI. And when we deploy to a different architecture. No, there may be some Java errors in your Java program that will only show up on a new architecture. But these machines are powerful and they can save your costs. So that's a way to cut your costs and you still stick to the same traditional pipeline of development. You can run your CI there, you can even develop right there. Uh, you can create native images or use your classical JVMs. All the modern Java versions are available. All optimizations are available to you. It's now being run very effectively. You get all the garbage collectors. Oh, well, why not to try it? And if you have any questions, you can always ask, or you can ask them right now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, I, I guess we have like time for some questions. Yeah. So what's your experience in migrate an actual software? So uh, software that was running uh, on Intel, Intel uh, CPU and migrate them. So uh, by default, have you seen just working or okay? There are some so what breaks? Yes, the, in short, um, you can check a bug tracker of your favorite big system like Kafka or Cassandra or Elasticsearch and search for a specific ARM64 or AR64 and you will find some bugs. But as I said, it's been a tier one platform for some years. So for all popular platforms, all the major f uh, problems uh, have already been fixed. So we are in a great situation right now. We can just take it and it works. Yeah, sometimes they are related to concurrency. That's that's an obvious example. That's why I show it. But, but this one was already wrong. So th th that's what yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, to understand. Okay, normally you should not have anything, or actually there are some stuff where it was not specified in, in the JVM and it behaved differently. On there were JVM bugs as well. Yeah. So we have certain bugs related only to a specific hardware architecture. As, and 
for the specific version of, a, the, of the architecture and for the specific CPU that implements that version, as well as optimizations. So optimization, optimizations that we make are being tested on different CPUs because that's the only way to ensure that that's really an optimization because sometimes they exploit some weaknesses of, uh, of your microarchitecture. I hope there was a question on top of Okay, yeah. No, well, that's, uh, really like, so is there a, a big investment from ARM to your project in case of basically Intel and AMD is providing intrinsic uh, ints to the GVM, so okay, uh, use that because this is the most efficient microcode to execute this, this GVM. Yes, ARM contributes to OpenJDK very much. Uh, Red Hat con contributes the offer of the port. And we do as well, so we continue that optimization work. You can see it, like right here. Arm should be here, I think. Yes, it's yeah, but also slow yeah, to the left. The support, but the, the optimization, so really saying, okay, this bytecode should be intrinsically transformed to this, or this method should, should be actually transformed to those set of instructions because this is the most efficient on Arm. Yes, that's what happens. There are specific optimizations for different code shapes or for certain uh, functions that has to be intensified. All right, you can find me and my colleagues on our booth or in the hallway. I'll be happy to answer additional questions there. Thanks again.